All right, well, good morning. We've started Concepts of Proof, and for a lot of folks, this is the most challenging part of the course because the whole point of the ambiguity, right? That did I, did I say what it is I wanted to say? Did I, did I make it very, very clear? So I'm gonna go backwards a little bit. The stuff I put for over the weekend was the lowest level. I wanted it to be the simplest stuff because a lot of your proofs were there exists proofs. So if I said there exists the following situation, you can find one example where it's true, you've proved it. Because there exists just means there's at least one. Where it gets harder is when I'm trying to show something is not true and finding a counterexample. That can be a little bit tricky. So I'm gonna start with a fairly simple one. Um, I'm gonna take one from sort of the end of what you were supposed to do, and it is the square of an odd integer I'll say can be written, can be, can be expressed as 8n plus 1 for some integer n. Let me make sure I said that correctly. Uh, form. Yes. So this goes to the, the very basic, how do you express an odd and even integer in general? But just as important, what do you get to assume? Now this is the tricky part. Okay, let's go back to high school geometry for a moment. Again, I asked this question before. Some of you had a formal geometry course where you actually did the two column proofs. Do you guys remember that? And more often than not, the statements were given, all you had to do was provide the reason. Okay, so you were trying to prove two triangles were congruent, let's say, given a little bit of information. And so you cited definitions, you cited postulates, you cited theorems, you cited corollaries. You may not have realized that's what they were called, but you gave the reasons. You never said, here's my conclusion. Because I can just make this statement, hey, square any odd integer and it can be written of the form 8n plus 1. You go, okay, well, why can't it be 4n plus 1? Why can't it be something else? Why can't it be 8n minus 1? That seems rather random or arbitrary, so we're going to prove it, which means all the parts of the proof have to be things we already know or things that we can conclude based on stuff we already knew. So let me go backwards just a little bit. What is a postulate or axiom? I, I use those two terms interchangeably because I taught high school geometry for several years, and in a geometry book, the words are essentially used interchangeably. Does anybody know what that means, axiom or postulate? Perfect answer. You heard me say that in another class? Oh, no. I, I watched the video from this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I have two points. Can you see them? I'm, I'm, I've got them between my thumbs. I have two points. How many lines can I draw through those two points? One. That's an O, oh, duh. Um, can you prove that, by the way? No. <laughs> you can't prove that. We have to accept that as an absolute fact, and we have no problem accepting that. It's an axiom. It's something that is so basic it cannot be proved. There are things that are so basic that cannot be proved and we have to accept them as absolute fact, and that would be one of them. So an axiom or a postulate, we, postulate, we call them the building blocks. And my favorite example I always like to use, because I, I have fun, because I make fun of myself in this one, is I use color. So, Jordan, can you define the color blue for me? Hmm. Probably not, I don't C think. Could you, you'd say at the very least, that ugly chair over there, that, that's blue. But you're pointing out an example of blue, but does that define blue for me? That's kind of like saying, can you define the taste of chocolate? Can you, you, by the way, a basic axiom would, of course, be chicken, because everything tastes like chicken, right? So you can't use chicken as an example. But if I said, can you define red for me? Oh, boy. Well, maybe that thing. Can you define yellow for me? Can you, do, can you define green? Actually, you can. What's green defined as? Blue. Mixture of blue and yellow. Wait a minute, how, can I, how come I can define green but I can't define blue or yellow? Because they're secondary, which is primary colors. Blue, red, and yellow are called the primary colors. They cannot actually be defined. They are the starting point of all color. And all color, I learned this when my kids were little. <laughs> I learned this. All color can be defined as some combination of those. Isn't that crazy? All color, right? like pink. Right? That's, what's pink? Anybody know? That's red and white. So what is white? 
That's actually the absence of any color. There's no color at all. Ooh. So if you think of it in those simple terms, all color can be defined based on these building blocks. They are the axioms of color. I can't define those, but I can define everything else. Now, definitions cannot be questioned. Definitions are, are something that, that, those are absolutes. You know, when I define something, I'm going to define a square. A square is a polygon with four congruent sides and four congruent angles. That is the definition of a square. You can't get any other shape if you do that. Now, you can't question that, but based on that definition, you can talk about all the different properties of a square, and then you can prove things. So in this context, there's two things that we are going to accept as absolute fact. And this is really important, because sometimes we want to make really bold conclusions, and you should be saying, can I say that? Is that a justified statement? Is that valid? Okay. A and B are elements of the integers. A plus B is an element of the integers, and A times B is an element of the integers. I'm going to add two integers together. I'm going to get back an integer. Are you cool with that statement? So in other words, it's closed to addition. I'm going to multiply two integers together. I'm going to get back an integer. Are you guys okay with that statement? Yeah. So multiplication is closed. Um, let, should we go ahead and try to prove those? No, they can't be proved. Those are absolute facts that are critical to most of the proofs that you hopefully just did over the weekend and a lot of the proofs we're going to do today. They're absolute facts. They cannot be proven. We have to accept them. They are axioms. They are basic starting points. They are building blocks for everything else. And I'm pretty sure nobody has an issue with when I combine integers, I'm going to get back an integer if it's addition and multiplication. Now, what if I took a quotient of integers? Is that necessarily going to be an integer? No, but that is the definition of what? Rational. A rational number. Oh, so what if I said, uh, I'll use different letters. This, this is something that was one of the proofs that you were asked to do if you, if you read the section. I have, let's say, M and N elements of big Q. M plus N is an element of big Q. M times N is an element of big Q. Do I have to accept these or can I prove these? What do you think? You can prove them. You can prove them. In fact, these were two things you would be asked to prove in the textbook. And if I don't understand how to prove them, then something like this will be a heck of a lot harder. So I want to walk through just the concept, okay? So if M and N are, let's do the addition one. It's, it's the same amount of work. I want to add those together and show. So what is the definition of a rational number? So we have to start with something. And again, this is stuff that we're not familiar with until we do a few problems. I want to prove that the sum of two rational numbers is still rational. So I have to create two rational numbers. In linear algebra, you wanted to show closure of addition of a particular set. So you said, let me just pick two random elements of that set. So you write them like anything that looks like that set. So I'm going to say, there exists, how about A, B, C, D? Such, oops, yeah, such that what? Uh, I'm sorry, A, B, C, D, sorry, in the set of integers, such that M equals A over B and N equals C over D. So I'm creating my two rational numbers. You with me on that? Now I say, well, do I have to declare B and D are not zero? That's probably not a bad idea, but if B and D were zero, those aren't rational numbers. And nothing I say after that would be true. So it is OK to say b and d are not 0, but it's redundant because this wouldn't be a rational number, would it, if that was a 0 on the bottom? It would be undefined. And you can't do anything mathematically with an undefined. So I've created two rational numbers. That's it. I have to start with something. So I am, this is the part I'm supposing. Okay. Now, what is m plus n? Well, that would be a over b plus c over d. Now using basic arithmetic, and you don't have to justify, you know, if I say, I'm going to add 3 plus 4 and get 7, do I have to give the reason? No. <laughs> 3 plus 4 is 7, you don't have to give a reason, that is what 3 plus 4 is. If I add these two things together, what am I going to get? And by the way, if it helps, think of it this way, I'm going to multiply by d over d, and here I'm going to multiply by b over b, why? Because I'm multiplying by 1, and I know multiplying by 1 won't change it. So what am I going to get? AD 
CB plus CB or BC over BD or DB. It doesn't matter what order we write it because we know multiplication is commutative. Now, that's what M plus N is. Now, tell me about AB, I'm sorry, AD. Okay, let's write it this way. Let's let R equal AD plus BC and S equal BD. I'm not doing anything there. I don't have to justify that move. I'm just going to restate it, those two things. Here's what I want to say is R and S are elements of the integers. Why? Because it's close to. Because, and in, I want to get the right words. I want us to be comfortable. Why? Because since integer, I can do them both at the same time. I don't need to do them as two separate statements. A lot of people do them as separate statements. Because integer addition and multiplication is closed. This is really, really important. I don't have to prove that. That's an axiom. I get that one. That's a freebie. I can't assume that rational number addition multiplication is closed. That I have to prove. But the integer part I don't have to prove. So do we all agree now? And I again, I'm saying, let's write this as r over s. Do we do we agree that r is an integer and s is an integer? Therefore, can I say this is an element of integers? Uh, excuse me, an element of the rationals? Because you just proved that r and s are both integers. What was our goal? To show this result was still rational. So we have just proved that the sum of two rational numbers is still rational. That's actually a very powerful thing. It's kind of an oh, duh, if you're a math person, like I already know that. But how would you prove it? So if someone say, how do you know that's true? Can I find a counterexample? Does everybody, everybody understand that's, that's how we prove it? Now, I don't prove it by using values. I'm proving it in general. So just like in linear algebra, for those who are linear, you've proved closure of addition or closure of scalar multiplication by taking two random elements, adding them together, and showing that result was in the set. We just took two random rational numbers, added them, and showed that result was in the set of rational numbers. I can't do it for specifics because I'd have to prove it for an infinite number of possibilities, and that, that would be a little bit too much. Now, the other thing we want to use is odd and even. And this is a fairly simple thing because this is really a definition, okay? For any integer, let's say k, so k is an element of the integers, 2k is even, 2k plus 1 is odd. This is kind of how we define odd and even. And by the way, we have to define odd and even. Odd, odd and even aren't results of something. An even number is any integer multiplied by 2. So if you thought of your set of even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, all of them are double another integer. Do we agree? Then if you think of your odd numbers, you know, 1, 3, 5, 7, none of those are doubled an integer. They're all one more than doubling. Could I have just as easily defined it as one less? Would that have made it less true? No. Just out of convenience, we say plus one. And a lot of that goes back to when you did sequences and series, if you think about it. Oh, I generally started my series that way. It was easier when I did a plus one rather than a minus one. It just it convenience thing. So with this statement here, this is a definition. I don't have to prove this. I get to assume this. Is everybody cool with that? Again, going back to the beginning, what do I have to show and what can I assume? I can assume definitions, I can assume postulates, but I need to state them in the process because if I don't state them, right, when I'm doing a proof and I said, there, I proved it, and you're saying, wait, how did you get from point A to point B? Oh, well, I just, you know, I know all these things are true. No, I need to state them along the way. I need to tell the story of how I got from the question to the answer, and if I leave out part of it, I may not have done an adequate job of proving it. That doesn't mean it's false. But you can't leave any stone unturned. You can't have any statements that say, well, you can't get from there, from there to there. You're missing a step or two. Okay? Um, if you look in the textbook, the author does a really good job of telling you bad form. Did anybody read that? Bad form. One of the things is assuming what it is you're trying to prove, which is a notorious thing I see in linear and in DiviQ. Prove the following. So the very first statement we'll make is the following. 
we'll make the conclusion as our first statement and then try to work backwards. No, that's not true. <laughs> you can't do that. So I want to show that the square of an odd integer can be written in this form. This one is actually really complicated. That's why I wanted to do this one. This is the, I'm going backwards just a little bit because the stuff we're doing today kind of piggybacks on everything from the weekend. So I need to create an even integer. Or excuse me, an odd integer. But I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to say, OK, let's, let's just think integers in general. But I, instead of using the number 2, this is cleverness. I want to use the number 4. Hmm. Now this is kind of a tricky one. Because this uses a little bit of the stuff we're going to do later on today. But if I said 4 times k, 4 times k plus 1, 4 times k plus 2, 4 times k plus 3. If I just kept going, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going forever and ever and ever. I want to state every possible way you can do odd or even by starting with 4k. Now, when I get to 4k plus 4, wouldn't this just be the same as 4 times k plus 1 all over again? k plus 1 would be an integer. And this would be 4 times k plus 1 plus 1. So it's kind of back to this form. I want unique forms. How, am I kind of restating myself here? It's kind of an odd example, but think of derivatives of sines and cosines. Every time I take a derivative of sine or cosine, I get a different answer. But after four run-throughs, don't I recycle all my things? After the fourth derivative, don't I get back to the start? So I go sine, cos, negative sine, negative cos, and then I start over, sine, cos. So I don't have to take more than four derivatives ever of sine and cosine to see, the, oh, I'm going to get the same thing. If I took the number 4k, do you agree the 4k has to be even? Why does 4k have to be even, by the way? Because it can be written as 2 times 2k. Does 4k plus 1 have to be odd, then? Can I write this as 2 times 2k plus 1? Ah. Now how about this one? Odd or even? So it's odd or even, 4k plus 2. Even. Obviously, if I multiply something by 4, it was already even. I'm by adding 2, but I'm, I'm proving it. And how about this one? That would be 2 times 2k plus 1 plus 1. Oh, so I'm going to stop here. Turns out because I'm repeating myself, if I start adding 4, 5, 6, because it's just like saying, well, I have one left over. This is part of the last part of today's lecture, but I'm going to go a little bit ahead. I want you to think about taking integers and dividing them by 4. Just think of integers divided by 4. This is a major part of the rest of today. When I divide this by 4, what do I get? 5. I get 5. How about this one? 5.25. I get no, you're never going to give a decimal answer in a discrete math class. No, you're going to get five and, one and a quarter. Or if you're in baby algebra, you'd say five with a remainder one. of one. That's actually what we do. We don't even do fractions. Do you agree it's five remainder of one? Well, what, if you do this on your calculator, your calculator is going to say five and basically a remainder of one. How about this one? And how about this one? And this one would be five remainder four, right? No. You can't have a remainder of 4 if you're dividing by 4. You'd be back. To, oh, now it starts over, doesn't it? Everybody see that? I can have a remainder of 1, a remainder of 2, or a remainder of 3. By the way, that would be a remainder of none. What do you notice? What do you notice? Remainder of 0, remainder of 2. That's an even remainder came from the even numbers. Remainder of 1, remainder of 3 are odd remainders. They came from the odd numbers. That's an absolute. We're going to prove that one later on today. You with me on that? So if I divided something by 4, there's four possibilities. I can have a remainder of none, 1, 2, or 3, which means I'd express my answer as integer something plus a fourth, something plus a two fourths, something plus three fourths. So there's only four possibilities then, in other words, if I'm using 4 as the multiplier. If I was using 10 as the multiplier, 
then there'd be 10 possibilities because I'd have the remainders of zero through nine. You got it? Ah, so these are the remainders of, if I divide any of these by four, I'm gonna get a remainder of zero, one, two, or three. But if I did four K plus four and divided it by four, I'd, back to, I'd be back to the zero remainder again. So after all of this, uh, I want to define an odd integer, but I want to use four instead of two. So what two values can I possibly have? These. So I have to do this problem in two cases, that it was the first one or the second one. Just Let's just make up a number. Uh, k is two, okay? k is two. The number nine can be written as four times two plus one. But the number 11 can be written as four times two plus three. And nine and 11 are two odd numbers, but they have two different representations if I use a four, don't they? So we're gonna do this. So case one, All right, so case one, okay? There exists a K in the set of integers such that in, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, what are we gonna call our odd number? Uh, such that, how about we call our odd number um, M? Okay. And I'm going to say, I actually I should start like this. Suppose m is an odd integer. Okay, sorry, I should really start with that statement. Suppose m is an odd integer, then first case is that I can write m as 4k plus 1. The second case is that I can write it as 4k plus 3. And those are the only two possibilities, by the way. Because 4k plus 5, 4k plus 7, 4k, they just recycle back to these because of the remainder thing. All right, so what do I want to do? I want to square m. I want to square m. Then what is m squared? Then m squared would be 4k plus 1 squared. And what would this be? I got to square correctly. So I'm starting by, I'm supposing m is odd, and then I'm saying what m looks like. Now m squared is this. Can we square this? Yes. So it is? 16k squared plus 8k plus 1. Beautiful. Boy, that looks really complicated. Focus on the first two terms only. Can I write that as 8 times 2k squared plus k plus 1? Hmm. Let n equal what? 2k squared plus k. 2k squared plus k. I think we're almost done. n is an integer since integer multiplication and addition are closed. I'd rather just say that as one statement. It is correct to say, you know, to do it one, k squared is an integer, then 2k squared is an integer, then 2k squared plus k is an <coughs> integer, right, breaking it down into steps. Would that be overkill? Yeah, just the whole thing is, because all you're doing is adding and multiplying. We did, we're not doing something else. Wait a minute, what about the square? That's k times k. <laughs> That's okay. So now what have we got? This equals 8n plus 1, and we are finished because n is an integer. Hmm. That wasn't so hard, was it? So have I proved this absolutely true yet? No, I gotta prove it for this guy. There's a, there's a problem, and I removed it, by the way. It, it was a problem, I, I think I had it on the practice test. And it was exactly the same problem. I said, determine if it was, this was a true statement. And there were two cases. One of the cases was true, but the other case was false. And a lot of folks, they got the first one and said, oh yeah, it's always true. But if you did the second case, the second case was actually false. And so I, I decided to remove that from the practice test because I thought eh, it might throw too many people off. Um, it was one of those questions where 
you thought you knew what you were doing and then it didn't work and you start questioning everything, I said, yeah, I'm better. I'll just leave that one off. So, second half. This is case two. Sorry, case. I should have said case one. Sorry. I have case. Case one. Okay. So, suppose M is an odd integer. Then there exists a K in Z such that M equals 4K plus 3. Now, what do you suppose we're going to do? The same thing. Exactly the same thing. Are we going to get exactly the same kind of result? Yeah. Are we going to get the same numbers? No. But when I do the second one, now I proved it. it it's kind of a cool thought. You know, if you're just messing around going, you know, if you take any odd number and you square it, any odd number and you square it, it's going to be the same as 8 times an integer plus 1. You win. That's not going to work. If I square 1, I'm going to get 1. Well, isn't that 8 times 0 plus 1? Oh, yeah, I guess that would work. 3 squared is 9. That's 8 times 1 plus 1. Right? 5 squared is 25. That's 8 times 3 plus 1. Now, that doesn't prove it. When I was a kid, I remember I would play around with numbers. I, I, was, I was bored a lot of times. And I would just mess around with numbers, you know, multiplying. And I would see patterns. And I'd always say, gosh, I see a pattern when I do things. I remember being really little and saying, let me take a perfect square, like five squared. Now let me do four times six, that's 24. That's one less than five squared. Huh. And then if I did three times seven, that's four less than five squared. And then two times eight, that's nine less than five squared. I go, every time I moved one, I got a, and I would, I'd mess around with numbers. And I go, God, I wonder if that's a pattern. Well, it is, isn't it? N squared, n plus one, n minus one, n plus two, n minus two. You're getting a difference of squares each time you do that. But I, I was thinking these thoughts long before I'd ever seen a variable or algebra. And I'd say, I wonder if there's actually a pattern there, because it sure seems that way. And I would mess around with numbers. I am pretty sure a significant number of important mathematical discoveries came because somebody recognized a pattern. They saw things going, gee, it seems like I have a pattern. I wonder if that's always true. And if you're a math person, what are you trying to do next? Prove it. Or if it's not always true, is it true a lot of the times and maybe there are cases where it's true and there are cases where it's not true. And that's even, you know, even harder. But that's the kind of stuff as math people we, we want to be able to do. Okay? So this would be a, a nice example. Now, what if I wanted to show something wasn't necessarily true? Hmm. That's a little bit trickier. That's some of the stuff we're going to do next day. So now I'm going to define something okay, called uh, divisibility. In baby algebra, how do you know, when you're working with polynomials, how do you know if something's a factor? For example, if I said, is x minus 3 a factor of you know, 3x squared minus 2x minus 12? How would I know if that's a factor or not? Hmm. You plug in three, see if it's zero. Okay, good. That's the simple way. That uses something called the remainder theorem. You know, let me go back to baby, baby algebra, arithmetic. Okay, is five a fact, a factor of twenty? Is five a factor of twenty-one? I'm asking two questions. How do I make my conclusion? Well, let's see, 20 divided by 5 is 4. Tw oops, 21 divided by 5 is 4 and a fifth, or you could say in baby algebra terms, 4 with the remainder. Yeah, we know we should always put the fraction. But the point being, how do I answer this question? Is this a yes or a no? First one. Yes. Is the second one yes or no? Okay, it's, it's not even the answer, it's the why. Why is the first one yes and the second one no? Or the second one has a remainder and the first one does not. That's actually the definition of a factor. Is there a remainder or not? Not is there an integer because these are variables. Ooh. <laughs> so if x can be any real number, then that part isn't as useful. So the question is this. 
If I did 3x squared minus 2x minus 12 over x minus 3, and we know how to do long or synthetic division, that's not the point, am I going to get something with a remainder, or am I going to get something without a remainder? With. Well, how do I answer this question? Well, one of the things I can, you can cheat and use the remainder theorem, if I take the root, which is 3, and I plug it into the numerator, any number I get is the numerator of the remainder. So if I put a 3 in there, what do I get? 27 minus 6 minus 12, is that 0? No, what is it? 9. nine. So that means my remainder is going to be a 9 in the end. My, I'm going to get something, I'm going to put something, something good, plus 9 over x minus 3. <laughs> How do you like that answer? I'm going to get something good. I'm going to do my longer synthetic. I'm going to get something happy, you know, 3x minus 2 or something like that, plus this. So the answer is no, but it's no because there's a remainder. That's why it's a no. Okay? Now, determining if there's a remainder or not, we have tricks from algebra. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in factorability. So, I'm going to make the following statement. This is a vertical bar. Now, a lot of folks have really bad mathematical habits, and it drives me nuts. People use really, really bad symbolic notation when they're doing math, even at the highest levels, because nobody ever pointed out to them <laughs> that it really wasn't a good thing. You know, there used to be a time, there was a time when textbooks would even point this out. I want to take one half of oops, one half of x. I want to find the reciprocal of 2x. Now, my experience, having taught math for a million years to a million and a half different people, is that 99.97% of all human beings will write the exact same thing for both of these. Are they the exact same thing? No, they're not even similar. Because what do all people do? 1 half x, 1 over 2x. <clears throat> and I, I would go out on a limb and say almost every person in this room would do exactly this. First of all, that should never be seen in any context except one. Do you know the only time you ever see that? You should ever see that symbol? <laughs> Percent. That's it. It does not mean quotient. If you go back and look at old textbooks, or you go even go back and look at old newspapers, this was an invented symbol in the 1800s. The symbol was invented by newspapers. Believe it or not. I have fun with this history. Because how many remember using it? Well, OK. How many have heard about a typewriter? You guys know what a typewriter is? I actually <laughs> took typing and learned how to type. I can type 100 words a minute. I, I don't spell everything correctly, so they invented the backspace key for me, by the way. That, that's my. Probably my most used key is the backspace, followed by the delete key. They, they kind of work the same way. But back in the old days, so you're writing a paper, and I want to say one half of the population. So you wrote, you got to the point, you scrolled, wrote the one, scrolled back, wrote the dash, scrolled the other way, wrote the two, and then scrolled back and kept writing. I'm not joking. That's how you wrote. So newspapers invented the symbol so you could write one slash two in a sentence form. The problem with the symbol is most people don't know how to use it. They use it ambiguously. As a child, I learned in school. The, believe it or not, they used to teach this. Do you know where the x has to be placed? If you extend the quotient bar, it has to be exactly the halfway. Now, where does the x go if I want to make this one quotient? It goes on top. What do most people do even when they write this symbol? They still put the x on the bottom. And this is maddening because in the lower level classes when I teach, if a person wrote it in the wrong place, it's an absolute guarantee that in the next step of the problem, they interpreted it incorrectly because they looked at what they wrote and they interpreted it that way. This should be 1 over 2x. This should be 1 half x. If you're going to use the slash notation, where does the x have to go? It has to go over here. There's no human being on planet Earth that's going to see that x in the numerator. Because you just put it in the denominator. So we never use that symbol. But I also have people do this way. One half, and they'll write it like this. Or worse, one half. That's my favorite one. 
By the way, I have calculus students who write all their quotients this way. They use a vertical bar of the same size as the symbols. So 112 is the universal one half. I'm not joking. I would say a significant percentage of calculus students write their one halves like this. Now, I'm going to show you something. This actually has meaning, and it does not mean that. A vertical bar does mean there's a quotient. But it does not mean A is the numerator and B is the denominator. Believe it or not, it's exactly the opposite. This statement says, and by the way, this is an absolute mathematical statement. This is anybody who does math after this point, now that they've learned this, knows exactly how to interpret this. This statement says A divides B. Does the number 5 divide 20? If I have 20 things, can I make five different piles that are all the same number of things? Think of it simply like that. Yeah. Does the number 5 divide the number 21? We'd say not evenly, right? We say things like that. I think evenly is a bad term because it means there would be a remainder. A divides B means simply that B over A is an integer. So does the number 3 divide the number 12? Is 12 over 3 an integer? Everybody got it? So in other words, this statement means that A was in the denominator and B was in the numerator. Oh my goodness. But this is not a quotient. This is a statement. This, these are words. A divides B. We are starting with the assumption when we use this notation, we are only talking about integers. We're not talking about decimals. We're not talking about real numbers. Why? Because if you're using real numbers, does 5 divide 21? Yeah, 4.25 times. You see the problem with that? Oh, then all real numbers divide all real numbers if I allow for remainders and decimals and stuff. Nope, we're only talking about integers. And then we define something dividing something. There's no remainder. That makes things actually way simpler, not way harder, doesn't it? It really limits. So the statement A divides B means that B over A is an integer, or we say, there exists a k in the set of integers such that b equals k times a. This is a more formal way of saying it. So 3 divides 12 because 3 times 4 is 12. There is an integer out there, 4, such that 3 times 4 is 12. Okay? This is a definition. Now, from this, we can prove a lot of really cool things. So the first thing, if A divides B and B divides C, does A divide C? 3 divides 6 and 6 divides 12, does 3 divide 12? Yes. It certainly seems reasonable. Therefore, I've proved it, right? Because I just found a couple numbers that worked. Should I do that first, though? Oh, yes. You have to convince yourself. This is not a joke. I believe as an absolute statement, you cannot prove anything you do not believe is true. In fact, if I said, all right, um, Samuel, I want you to prove the following ridiculous statement. Samuel's like, I don't think that's true at all. What's the first thing you're going to try to do? Realistic. Counter yeah, you're going to try to think of one that's not true. And you find a counterexample immediately. You go, I'm not, I can't prove it's true because it's not. I found a counterexample. It is not possible to prove something is true that you do not believe is true because you won't have a route. You'll spend your whole time trying to disprove it. I, I have a, I'm not going to say it because this is being recorded, but <laughs> I had a situation many years ago when I was in grad school where I was asked to present uh, something that I didn't believe was true. And so I spent my, it took me minutes to disprove it. <laughs> it was a PhD thesis that somebody had written and gotten their PhD already had a major university, <laughs> and it took me 15 minutes to disprove it. It was absolute garbage. And I was asked to, that was a graduate class. Everybody had a thesis that had been already, you know, recorded and submitted and, and filed and, and uh, copywritten and all this, and we were asked to then present it. So now we had to learn it and present it. It was a very difficult project, and I didn't believe it right when I started reading it, so I spent my whole time trying to disprove it, and like I said, it took me minutes. And that presented a real problem. Because <laughs> this person was now a higher level faculty at a major university, and there was some corruption. I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to. <laughs> but 
<laughs> but if you don't believe it, it's not true. So I think it's always a good idea. Calc 3, you, when you did limits, we hated limits in Calc 3, right? I'm approaching an ordered pair, and I don't know if it's true. So l let me just plug in some numbers and see if it's true kind of thing. Sometimes you can mess around with something, and you say, yeah, you know what? I, I think that's true. I think I buy that one. I, I was thinking of a couple of examples in my head, and it seemed to work. That's not a proof but that's convincing you of its truth, then you can go on. Is there a significant number of uh, formulas that you've learned in your life that you never saw proof for, or at least at the time? What's the area of a circle? Area of a circle. Pi R squared. Duh, everybody knows that. And, and did you ever see a proof for it? Yeah, in the end of Calc 2. In the end of Calc 2, you saw a proof for that. Volume of a sphere, at the end of Calc 1. Oh, um, by the way, area of an ellipse, end of Calc 3, Green's theorem. There's a backwards way of doing it. I showed you Calc 3. It's very, very cool. Those are simple geometric formulas we learned as children, yet we didn't see the proof until calculus. We had no problem accepting they were true, but we also found out later, oh my gosh, I, I accepted something that I had no idea why it was true. Now when I see the proof, Yes, I still believe it, but there's a lot of math you've seen in your life that you weren't shown the proof. But it certainly was reasonable. So what we'll often do in a math class is we'll demonstrate its truth. In a calculus textbook, a significant number of the theorems that you are shown are not proven. Um, a common phrase that used to be used in a calculus book, you're presented a theorem and then you're given several examples of its truth. But it will say, proof of this theorem beyond the scope of the text. That was the most common term. You say, well, then how do I know it's true? If you were a math major, maybe your senior year in an upper division math class, now you're proving calculus theorems. That's what some of those courses are. You're proving a lot of your calculus theorems after you've had four years of math because you wouldn't have understood the proof. You saw things like volume of a sphere at the end of Calc 1 because now you understood how it was derived but you couldn't have understood the derivation anytime sooner. So therefore you weren't shown the derivation. We're okay with that, right? Are you right? You're, we're okay. So if you convince yourself that it's true by just playing around with numbers, I think that's always a good thing. Otherwise, if I don't believe that's true, I'm gonna spend the next however many minutes trying to disprove it. But if it's true, I'll never find an example that disproves it, so I'm wasting my time. So I wanna prove this is true or at least find a counterexample. Now, on the road to proving it's true, I may find something just falls right into my lap. You know, a counterexample. Oh, shoot, it's not going to work in this case. I might get lucky. So, let's start with this. All right, so suppose, I'm starting my proof. Suppose A divides B and B divides C. These are now absolute facts. They cannot be questioned. In a, in a trial, this is the evidence. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with the conclusion of guilty or not guilty. You got it? I can't question the evidence. This is absolute. A divides B and B divides C. Now, there exists, let's say, R and S. R and S in the set of integers such that B equals A times R and C equals, where are we? I'm sorry, and, yeah, C equals B times S, there we go, okay? If A divides B, then there's an integer R such that B equals A times R. If four, or I use three, three divides 12, then three times four equals 12. So if A divides B, then A times some integer equals B. B divides C, so B times some integer equals C. Can A be bigger than B? Can A be bigger than B? No. No. Can A equal B? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So A has got to be less than or equal to B. You all agree with that? One divides six, two divides six, three divides six, six divides six. But nothing bigger than six will divide six. By the way, can any of these be negative integers? Yes. Yes. I said integer. I didn't say positive integer. By the way, that won't present a problem in general. So don't, don't worry about positive and negative. But you can use that in the back of your mind if you find a counterexample. I'll, I'll show you one that's really cool. So this is fact. Why well, I don't have to. This is the definition of divisibility. You can say by the definition of divisibility. 
That is totally correct. That's what you'll see in the textbook. Because when I make a statement like this, what's my justification? It's by definition of divisibility. Now, look at these. So C equals B times S, but that's A times R times S, correct? Which is A times RS. Tell me about R and S. What are they again? Integers. They're integers. Let T equal RS. T is an element of the integers since, in this case, I'm multiplying. Integer multiplication, in, inter, integer. Is closed. Okay, so now we have this equals a times t. t is an integer. If c equals a times t for t an integer, what does this symbol mean? Therefore. therefore. You see this a lot. We love therefore. Okay? Because it means we're done. Therefore, conclusion. What's my conclusion? A divides C. So if A divides B and B divides C, A divides C. Beautiful. Everybody cool with that? Okay. That, that wasn't so bad, was it? If A divides B, and B divides A, then A equals B. True or false? False. It's a tricky one, isn't it? False. Why is it false? Negative is positive. Oh. Let A be 10, B negative 10. Does 10 divide negative 10? Yes, because 10 times negative 1 is negative 10. Does negative 10 divide 10? Yes, because negative 10 times negative 1 is 10. A and B can be the same number with opposite signs, and these statements would be true, wouldn't they? So how did you come up with that, Sam? It just was obvious? Choked off the page? Now, do you see, everybody see the problem with that? that? It certainly sounds reasonable, doesn't it? And how often is this statement true? Half the time, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if A and B are the same signs, is this statement true? Yes. Oh, but we said from the set of integers, we did not say the set of positive integers. So if I was trying to prove this, I believe this is true. It's not. Because I'm thinking of things in my head. Well, two divides four and four doesn't divide two. Two divides two and two, oh yeah, they gotta be the same number. That's what most people would think. So according to the first statement, look at the first statement. It means that B equals, let's call it A times R. And on the other side, A equals B times S. So that would mean that B equals, replace, a with B, S, so B times S times R. By the way, neither A nor B can be zero in this context, because that would mean something's got a denominator of zero. So just be careful. Can I have zero in this? Yes, but I'm gonna show you where that comes in. In this case, neither one could be zero, because both of them end up being in the denominator at some point. So look at this statement here. What does it say? S R equals one. S times R equals one. And S and R are integers. And this is the point, he said S and R integers and their product has to be one, which means they're either both one or, both. or they're both negative one. It's the both one is fine. The both negative one is what just happened here. If they're both negative one, then we got them being opposite signs. True or false? <laughs> that was pretty convincing. True. <laughs> Is there an integer out there that a times that integer equals zero?
Yeah. yeah. So therefore, all integers divide zero. Ooh, zero's, now where have we seen that kind of statement before? Think calc three. Aren't all vectors orthogonal to the zero vector? And when I dot any vector with the zero vector, don't I get the number zero? And the zero vector is a real thing. I mean, do you see the similarity? There's a real similarity with vectors with the zero vector and the number zero. So every number divides zero. Zero does not divide any number. Be careful with that one, okay? So this is called divisibility and rules of divisibility. Manipulating this is actually fairly simple, okay? So let's, let's do a, 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 another example of this. <coughs> Okay, if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides, how about um, 4B minus 2C? Do you think that statement's true or false? In, in simple English, for those because a lot of you have had other classes, if A divides B and A divides C, I'm saying then A divides a, what do we call it when we take scalar multiples of things and add them together? If those were vectors, we'd call that a linear combination. So I'm saying if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides a linear combination of, a, of B and C as long as my scalars are integer values. If I put fractions in here, we already know it's, it's not going to be true. Because we can all find examples. If, if you made, um, instead of four and two, if I use you know, one half and one third, it'd be really easy for you to find numbers that it just doesn't work for. Okay, because I can't get fractional answers. So how would I show this? Um, like we did the last one. So let's walk through this problem. So suppose A divides B and A divides C. This is now not questionable. This is absolute. This is the law. I don't know if my conclusion is true, but I know this is true because this is what I'm starting with. I don't have to prove this. Sometimes we, we don't realize what do I get to assume and what do I have to prove. If I say, if prove the following statement, if A, then B, well, you get to assume A. Okay. You get to assume A, you have to conclude B. You don't say, well, what if A is not true? Well, then there's no proof going on. So let's do what we did before. Then there exists R and S in integers such that B equals A times R and C equals A times S. And again, if you want to, it's, it's good form to say by the definition of divisibility. I know in the textbook the author always throws that in. It's correct. It, it's kind of redundant, but it is correct, and it, there's nothing wrong with that. If you were doing a formal paper, I mean, you were, you were presenting a formal mathematical big concept proof, this would be a minor step in your big, huge thing you were proving, okay? So you would not leave anything out because you're trying to come up with this grand conclusion by doing all sorts of little parts, and you never want any of your little parts to be questioned as to their validity. So. By the definition of divisibility is a good statement. I, I'm not going to require it. But I do always want to show, the, when I'm saying this is a conclusion, I always want to state because of the closure part. Because only integers are closed when it comes to addition and multiplication. We have to prove the other ones are. Now, if we've proved rational numbers are, do I have to prove it if I'm going to use it later on? This is a tricky one. Okay, think calc one. You derived the derivatives of most of your functions using limits. It was a real headache, but you did, right? Sine and cosine were probably the toughest ones. And you did product rule, and you did quotient rule, and you did chain rule. You got all your things. Now when you're doing a higher level problem, you got to go back and prove all the original derivatives you were using. You want to differentiate e to some functional power. I've already derived all my derivatives along the way. Do I have to go through limits to derive each step again? Or once I derive them, do I get to use them as facts from now on? Same thing with antiderivatives. Once you derive them, they're now facts. Think surface area in calc three. Once we derive the formula, we now have that forevermore. I don't have to re-derive a formula once I have it. So when we've proved something in this class, we've just proved, for example, closure of addition for rational numbers. So you can now use that as a fact. 
You with me? We're going to do a really cool proof um, tomorrow. We're going to prove the square root of 2 is irrational. I know, I know that's an O, duh, but that's because you, you know it is. If I ask you, well, can you prove it? No, you couldn't. <laughs> but we're going to prove it. It's a really cool proof. You never have to prove it again. We're going to use that proof to then prove other things, in other words. Okay. So in this case here, I'm gonna, this is absolute. Nothing I've written can be questioned. But now I've got to mess around with this because I need to show the divisibility of my result there. All right, so what are we going to do? Let's start with 4b minus 2c. What is 4b minus 2c in, in my new terms now? Now that I have this. So it's 4 times AR minus 2 times AS. Minus 2 times AS. How do I want to manipulate this? Obviously, I can factor. What do I want to factor, though? Do I want to factor out a 2? No, I just want to factor out only what? Only the A. Because I need to show it's A times an integer. Ah, I know I can factor out a 2, but that's, that's not what I need. So can I write this? Is that correct? So now I'm going to... Good form is to rename this. Let t equal 4r minus 2s. t is an element of the integers again, since integer addition and multiplication are closed. Okay? Thus, this is equal to 4t and, I'm sorry, 4t, <laughs> get rid of my own writing, at, so what do we have? Or I'll, I'll say therefore, not and. Therefore, a divides 4b minus 2c. That wasn't very complicated, was it? Everybody okay with that? That one was, that was pretty simple. I think that's as far as I want to go on that part. All right, now we're going to move on to a really cool but really simple concept. It's called the quotient and the remainder theorem. And remainder theorem. Now, again, we're starting with only integers. We're only using integers in this concept. If we allow for real numbers in general, or even rational numbers, some things get kind of muddled. Because like I said, um, we say 4 divides 20 because I have an integer result and no remainder. But if we're allowing for anything, 4 then divides all real numbers, doesn't it? Because I can divide anything by 4 and get a decimal answer. I get a terminating decimal, in fact. But I only want integer values, okay? Because otherwise, things get a little bit confusing, okay? So, let me go to the definitions here. Um, hold on. I'm going to leave out the floor and ceiling part, because that gets a little bit... Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on a minute. Am I getting ahead of myself? No. No, we're going to do Okay, good. Now, the question is, we did this before, does 5 divide 21, or is this true? Both of them are the same question. And you said no because there is a remainder. Okay with that? There, there's a remainder. So how would I write this? 
How about if I wrote it this way? 21 equals 5 times 4 plus 1. Okay? Everybody okay with that? 5 was my denominator, but 4 and 1 were results. Because I, I could say, how about if I wanted to do 5 dividing, dividing the number 17? You'd say 17 equals 5 times 3 plus 2. I could do this for all integers. Do you agree? Positive or negative. So I'm actually more interested right now in the ones where it doesn't divide. I'm actually interested in those because then I have remainders. I can state things. So the 4 and the 1 are huge in this case. The 3 and the 2 are huge in this case. We're actually giving them names. And a lot of you have heard these terms but you may not have understood the context. So if I said in words, how many times does 5 go into 21? Wouldn't you all say 4 times? If I said, is there a remainder? You'd say, yes, it's 1. The terms are div and mod. How many have heard those terms before? What, what context? Programming. Programming. It probably is the exact same meaning. Div is how many whole times did it go in? So if I said, what is 21 div 5? What do you think the answer is? 3. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> four, 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 four. I don't think how about 4? Yeah, okay. And if I said 21 mod 5, 1. Oh, OK. Div for how many times does it divide it? Mod. Let me know what that's short for. Modulus. Modu. Modulus. Modulus. Which one is it? Modulus is the absolute value of a complex number. <laughs> that's <laughs> modulo. Oh, that's, there's two different ones. Yeah, mo modulus. Uh, if I said, what's the absolute value of a complex number in, in baby algebra, they called it the modulus. And they said, oh, it's not the same thing as absolute value. And then you calculate it. Oh, it is the same thing. <laughs> you were lied to your whole life until you got the calculus and you realized, oh, modulus is a meaningless term in mathematics. It's absolute value of a complex number, so don't even worry about that. Modulo, and that's going to be a really important word. So I want to keep it really simple because we're going to spend a lot of time on this later. But if I look at the clock, I like using the clock as a perfect example. We have 12 o'clock is kind of like zero, isn't it? Because an hour later it's 1 o'clock. And then two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. There's no 14 o'clock. There's no 27 o'clock, right? <laughs> four hours ago was not negative something o'clock. The clock numbers just keep going. So if I said, what's the time 12 hours from now? Won't it be the same time? What's the time 14 hours from now? It'd be that time plus two. Everybody okay with that? That's, that's the modulo part. If I said, you know, give me 8,000 days plus three hours. Okay, then it'd be 12 o'clock. <laughs> the 8,000 days would kind of be like your div. The modulo would be the remainder. So when I'm doing clock, and we're going to do this later on, but we talk about clock that we actually think about in those terms. So div and mod are actually really <laughs> simple concepts and really easy to employ, but I have to know what they mean. So when I'm doing numbers div and mod other numbers, let's, let's start real simple. This should never be something that we labor at. All right, let's take a, I want 37 <laughs> div 8, and I want 37 mod 8. So what's the first one? Four and the second one is five. five. Question: Why can't it be five, negative three, or can it? Ooh, ooh. Do you see any problem with that? This is true. I'm not, I'm not asking. This is true. 
we'd say one, that would be my div, and this would be my remainder, but the remainder's negative. But that's how we write it, don't we? Oh, my numerator is smaller than my denominator, so you see technically it doesn't go in, but I, oof. nobody says nine tenths is one minus one tenth. Nobody says that. Is that true, though? But nobody says that. We don't start doing a remainder until we exceed one. So this is a representation of this quotient, but this is not div and mod. Nine tenths is one minus one tenth. But mathematically, from our point, nine tenths is zero plus nine tenths. So here's the rule. This is no good because, uh, I'm gonna use the same letters that the book uses. They use D, Q, okay. So N is an element of the integers. It does not have to be a positive integer. This is crazy. Yeah, we're gonna do negative integers, okay? N then is D, Q, plus R. Okay, we'll call the div D, we'll call the R the mod. But here's the rules on R. Q was my, my divider, Q is my denominator, if you will, okay? So in this case here, this is my Q. Tell me about R. Can you have a remainder of zero? What's the biggest, when I'm dividing by five, what's the biggest possible remainder I can have? Four. Four. Because I can't have a remainder of five, that means it went in evenly. You don't say 20 divided by five is three with a remainder of five. No, you say it's four. <laughs> Everybody okay with that? 19 would be three with a remainder of four, but 20 would be exactly. Okay, so what's the biggest the remainder can be? Q minus one. Q minus one. Yeah. R's in the middle. Gotcha. But here's the rule. Here's the rule. R cannot be negative. We're defining it this way. It's not because there was nothing wrong with me saying 37 is 5 times 8 minus 3. That is, there's nothing wrong with that statement. But for div and mod, the mod cannot be negative. Therefore, we, we go with this one. Uh, by the way. Is there anything wrong with saying it's six times eight minus 11? <laughs> we can start getting silly. Aren't there an infinite number of integer representations? Yes, but there's only one that has a non-negative remainder, and that's the one we're gonna choose. You like that, by the way. You don't like ambiguity. Oh my gosh, where do you have ambiguity? Polar coordinates. <laughs> I need you to represent a position on the unit circle, but if I add two times k pi to that, don't I get to the same position? which means every position on your unit circle has an infinite number of representations. So what do we usually do? We say, oh, let's keep it between zero and two pi, but there's no rule that says it has to be. That's the only thing people hate about polar coordinates, is there's an infinite number of representations of most things, and it can be very confusing as a result. Now, when I'm doing the calculus, and I'm finding arc lengths or surface areas or anything, I'm only gonna get one answer, because regardless of what representation I chose, I'm still gonna get the same answer generally. But in this case here, we want one answer and one answer only. So we, we operate with this restriction. Now, I said it doesn't matter if I have positive or negative, and that's where it gets kind of fun. And on your, on your quiz for this, I asked you a whole bunch, a few, actually, did I ask you a whole bunch of questions? Let me check. No, I just asked you for a couple, okay. On the exam, I think I've asked you for a few, okay. Let's do negative six div five and negative six mod five. Negative four. Okay, hold on, hold, hold that move too fast. Now everybody stare at that for a moment. There's two ways I can approach this. I can say negative six divided by five equals and then the remainder, but the problem is my remainder is gonna be a negative number if I do it that way, won't it? So what I really need to do is say negative six equals blank times five plus blank, and that's gotta be a plus. But that K 
can't be a plus, can it? No. So, what did you say, Neil? Negative two, four. Negative two plus four. Does that work? Does any other combination of numbers work? There's an infinite number of combinations, but there's no other combination that works where this number is positive. So my answer is actually unique. Therefore, what's the answer? Negative two, negative two four. positive four. We want to make sure we don't get them flip-flopped. By the way, is, is there any question I can ask that would actually be hard? No, could it be confusing? Yeah, but I just have to pay attention and look at it. Now, this here, okay, there, it comes from something called a greatest and least integer function, floor and ceiling. How many remember doing something like that? In Diffie Q, we did that. Uh, another name for it, how many have heard of a step function? Yeah, yeah they're, they're all the same thing. But depending how you define your inequalities. So I'm going to give you a really simple example of this. Okay, um, this is my favorite example to use because you have done this before. The calculus of this is horrible, but the differential equations on this, for those who are in, in my 255 class, is actually kind of simple. Okay, because we define the unit function. Remember the unit step function, and like all of a sudden it got kind of easy. Consider the following. Put dot dot dot. This keeps going. Okay. This is postage. This is. Think of this as ounces. Think of this as stamps. Everything up to and including one ounce requires one stamp. The moment you are a subelectronic particle over one ounce, all the way up to two ounces, you need stamps. Everybody get what? So this is called a least integer function, or a step function, or a floor ceiling function. That's that's where it came from. I like using postage because it's really simple. So if you're trying to figure out, I'm gonna send a whole bunch of documents and I stuff them in an envelope and I'm mailing it. How many stamps do I need? We'll weigh it. Okay, it ended up being two and a half ounces. So how many stamps do I need? Three. You got to round up. <laughs> but if I was lucky enough for it to be exactly three ounces, still three. But you know, a, a little dust particle fell on it. Okay, now it's heavier. Now that's that's the concept. In the remainder sense, it's not exactly the same. In the remainder sense, these go where? At the other end. So it's closed at this end and open at this end. I don't get to the next thing. So in that sense, it's called a greatest integer function. Don't worry about those terms greatest and least. It's it's backwards. What's the least that it's still greater than or equal? What's the greatest that it's still less than or equal? It's called a step function. It's called a floor ceiling function, greatest or least integer function. Those who've used those before, they're not fun to work with, but that's all this really is because I'm only using integer values. The moment I get up to Q, what's the problem? Now I'm really back to a remainder of. So when I said 20 divided by five, I could say it's three with the remainder of five, but I'm dividing by five, and I got all the way up to my divisor, which means that I really had a remainder of zero. If I get up to Q, I really had a remainder of zero, and I should increase div by one. Everybody cool with that? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let's do a couple more. I, want you, I just want you guys to get the hang of this. This is really important and useful for stuff we're going to be doing later. Um, and later, I mean like this week. We're going to do something on Wednesday. It's an algorithm. It's a very famous algorithm, uh, ways of expressing numbers as linear combinations, that it's really, really simple arithmetic, but it's something you've probably never seen, and it's kind of cool. But it uses this as the underlying concept. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in remedial algebra, I, would, I, used, I taught pre-algebra a few times. And I mean really, really low level. I would show them an, al an algorithm for a division that most calculus students had never actually seen and didn't realize. It was a really easy way of doing things. I'll, I'll give you an example. 
If I was trying to find the greatest common factor or greatest common divisor, see at this level you stop saying factors, you say divisors. All of our life we always said GCF, right? You're never gonna see that term again. What are you gonna see? GCD, and everyone's confused. Yeah, we stop saying factor, we say divisor. Why? I don't know. Divisor just sounds cooler, I guess. It's sort of like when you're young, you say adult, and then when you get older, you say adult. adult. Yeah, that's how you know somebody is matured, right? They're, I don't know. <laughs> but there's a really simple algorithm that if I wanted to find the greatest common factor or divisor between two large numbers, it's really easy. It's really, really, really simple. And it doesn't involve the old factoring tree, the way you learned it originally. There's a really simple algorithm that if you gave me any two integers, no matter how big they were, I could come up with the GCF really, really quickly. Having a calculator on hand helps for the arithmetic. It's a very simple algorithm, and most people have never seen it, because the only time you ever see it would be in a remedial class, which is backwards. If I wanted to find the rules of divisibility of numbers, do you know there are rules? For example, every even number has a factor of Two, let's go with every number that ends in a five or a zero has a factor of five, right? And don't think of the number zero, think of non-zeros. Every number where I add the digits together and that sum is a multiple of three, you know there's a rule there? Three is a factor. But the, the, better, the cooler one is if the digits add up to a multiple of nine, then nine is a factor. If your last two digits are divisible by four, then four is a factor. There, there's, a, there's a rule literally for the numbers one through 11. 10 is boring. If your number ends in a zero, yeah, 10 is a factor. But there are actually rules of divisibility for the numbers one through 11. Seven and 11 are really complicated. I'm not, I'm not interested in those. So those are not worth remembering. But the other ones are fairly easy. But how do you get six? Two or three. Yeah, the sum of the digits is a multiple of three and it's an even number. Now you have two and three. So you can have some fun, but all of these involve this type of mathematics and this type of understanding. Everybody okay with that? So it's, it's kind of neat, it's kind of it's easy in some cases. Okay, let's do, oh I said we're gonna do a few problems. So I want you, let's do the following. Let's just start by writing it in this form, where the D is the, the div and R is the mod. Mod always refers to remainder. Yes, modulo. Modulo is a, is a higher level term for us. It it's actually refers to something a little bit different. It refers to basically all integers that have the same remainder. It's, called, it's something called an equivalence class. We're gonna do that, I think, in chapter eight. It's, so the word modulo, we're not really going to use for a while, but we, all, we understand that's what mod is short for, okay? Um, let me give you, n is 42, q is five, n is 36, q is four, n is negative seven, q is 10. Now let's take a moment, and I want to write each of these in this form. Can you do this in your head? Probably. As long as the numbers aren't too large, particularly as long as the Q is not too large. Let's see if we got any answers. So anyone want to try the first one? Anybody other than Sam? <laughs> so that probably leaves you mad. 42 equals eight times five. So if I ask the question 42 div five, your answer would be eight. eight 42 mod five, two. 
everybody understands the same question. It's just the representation. I'm asking for this representation. So you don't physically have to state the div in the mod. You have to just know which parts, all right? That was easy enough. 36 equals. Nine times four plus zero. Is that allowed? Yeah. Yeah, mod can be zero. What's the only rule on mod? Can't be greater than two. Yeah, there's a range. It can't be negative, and it has to be smaller than my denominator. This is the denominator, by the way. It has to be smaller than the denominator, but it cannot be negative. So it has a range of values. The last one? Negative one plus two. Is that hard? I hope not. <laughs> Can we make mistakes on that? Yeah, I mean, going too fast, but that's not something I'm hoping we make any mistakes on. That, that, I'm hoping that's, that was a fairly simple process. Okay. Now, I want to do another problem. I'm going to go backwards a little bit, because this stuff here really shouldn't trouble us. This is definition, and then how do I use this? This is a stepping stone. This is not an end all, not this part. So. Now that we understand rules of divisibility, I have a question, okay? For k in the set of integers, if n equals 2k plus 3, does 4 divide, also let me see which one I want to do, does 4 divide 3n plus 1? I'm not telling you it, it's true. It might not be true. Now what you don't want to do is this would be too complicated to try to come up with. <laughs> There's too many things going on, right? I see. I have an integer k, so now n is 2k plus 3. So what type of numbers are n? Odd. But what not? 3, it would be odd numbers, right? Yeah. 3, 5, 7, 9. That's a good way to start. That 2. So n is clearly an odd number. I want to take 3 times n, and I want to add 1 to it. Now, you're thinking 3 times the odd number I think you think logic is probably odd. Now I'm going to add one, and now it's even. Are we cool with that? But does that mean it's a multiple of four necessarily? What is it a multiple of? Two. two. But I didn't ask you two. I asked you four. So don't assume anything. I want to prove this or disprove it. But I don't want to try to do it by examples. Let's do what we did earlier. I want to see if I can rewrite this and essentially factor out a four. Okay, we did something similar when we did the 8n plus 1. Remember that? This is a little bit different. So, what should we assume? So, let's suppose... Okay. Suppose there exists a k in the set of integers such that n equals 2k plus 3. You could say suppose n equals 2k plus 3 where k is an integer. There's, a, there's an integer out there and n equals 2 times that integer plus 3. Now there is no restriction on k. k can be any integer positive or negative. It does not have to be odd or even. We agree that n clearly is odd. Does that matter in the long run? No. At no point am I going to use that fact and try to prove it because there's an odd number. We just in the back of our minds we realize, okay, for any integer, 2 times that integer plus 3 is still going to be odd, because this is, if it helps you think of it this way, is this is 2 times k plus 1 plus 1. I don't need that. But in the back of my mind, it's probably good to keep that. So now what do I want to do? Let's find 3n plus 1. Okay. Then 3n plus 1 equals 3 times 2k plus 3 plus 1. Now what do I got? 6k plus 9 plus 1 is 6k plus 10. Is 
that a true statement mathematically? Is that an integer? It is if k does not equal zero. Or well, just in general, if k is odd, strange. I mean, odd. If k is any odd integer, then this is an integer. That's easy to show, isn't it? Well, what if k is an even integer, like zero? Then no. Hmm. Let t equal three half. By the way, you notice I had to pull out a four. I could have pulled out a two, but I had to pull out a four. Could I have pulled out a two cleanly, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Two would have been wonderful. Gosh, why didn't you ask two, Mr. Brown? That would have been so much easier. So rather than counter examples, I'm going to show you how to do this generally. Here's the problem. If something is true an infinite number of times, hmm, that's, that makes it tricky because I can come up with, all day long I can come up with k's that, that make this beautiful. But if I let this be this plus five halves, okay, for any even k, t is not an integer. So what can we say? For three n plus one, how do I say it? It's actually that simple. Just put it, cross it off. It does not. How do you say not an element? You cross off the element. How do you say not uh, in a subset? You just cross it off. I know it, <laughs> it doesn't seem very formal, does it? But even on my computer, when I'm selecting the symbols, I have not element as a symbol. You know, I, those are actually symbols. So this would be not. So the question is, does 4 divide 3n plus 1? The question is, but is it a yes or is it a no? Well, actually, there, there is a yes in there. Yes if, we just did it. If k is odd, odd no if k is even. Ooh, that's a better answer, isn't it? Because when you say no, it sounds like you're saying it's always not true. You've got to be really careful now. If something's true an infinite number of times, but it's also false, then it is not always true. But not always true does not make it always false. Not always true means there exists a case where it's false. Do you see the problem here we get into? If I say this statement is false, period, then what am I saying? What I'm saying it is always false false. It isn't always false. It's true exactly an infinite number of times, but it's false an infinite number of times. So it's better to say that statement is true if k is odd, but it is false when k is even. So it's not always true. So do we not need to prove it and disprove it for odd and even integers? Like, we, do we don't really need to show anything? That, by the way, that would be a really, this, this is exactly what I was talking about, the problem that I removed. Um, I did it this way. A better way would have been to do it in cases, but that's a really long approach. So we'll go back to what Matthew said. This was the problem I essentially removed from the practice test. If I said, let's do cases. First case, k is even. If I were make k even, now I'm, I'm replacing k with, I don't know, 2r. This would have worked. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, this would have failed. Now let me make k odd. I'm going to replace k with 2r plus 1. This would have worked. So if I do it in cases, one of the cases it worked, one of the cases it failed, then I can say it's true in this case, it's false in this case. That's, a, that's actually a better answer. I mean, if, like at the end, with the 3 half k plus 5 halves, like, is that where you would pull in the cases? So case... You, you like, could, you do yeah. It then? We could do it right here. Okay. We could do it here, or the beginning of the problem probably would have been cleaner. That probably would have been cleaner to do at the beginning. The point is, is that we have, if you're saying, is something true or false, is this statement an absolute mathematical statement? No. But be careful that we don't want to say things like it's always false. 
That, that was, that's my whole point. It's not always false. It's true half the time. But it's false half the time. So can we do things like, when I square an integer, I'm always going to get an even integer. Is that a true statement? When I square an integer, it's always going to be even. Is that true? Yeah. No. I square one, I don't get it even. If I square an even integer, it's always even. If I square an odd integer, it's always odd. Are those statements true? Yeah, so that, with things like squaring an integer, now I gotta think about cases. It is true exactly half the time. The square of an even integer is always an even integer. The square of an odd integer is always an odd integer. That's a really simple proof that, that would have been a weekend problem. So if I said, is the square of an integer always even, you'd say no, it's only even if I'm squaring an even integer. You see, that's a better answer because integers are odd or even, and therefore results are typically odd or even. That's where we have to be a little bit careful because, again, we don't want to say always false. Now, are there things that are always false? Do you think mathematically things are always false? Yeah, odd numbers are not divisible by two, ever. <laughs> it's, that's always false. So odd numbers are always divisible by three, right? Are odd numbers always divisible by three? No. No, how many of the odd numbers are divisible by three? Exactly a third of them. <laughs> oh, that makes it easier. <laughs> yeah. Every third odd number is divisible by three if you start counting by odds. Um, don't, don't worry about that part. Okay, that's irrelevant. So if I'm trying to show something is true, now, next day we're actually going to do the contradictions where we're actually going to be looking for the counterexample. So if I ask this question, and you could think of a number right at the start that made it false, that might be okay, but we're trying to determine if this is always you know, true or always false. Finding a counterexample, once again, does not make something always false. In fact, what if, you're, what if there was only one counterexample to something? Oh my gosh. Think about that for a moment. The square of an integer is always positive. Heck, let me go a step further. The square of a real number is always positive. So if I square a negative number, it's positive. So the square of a real number is always positive. We'll keep it with integers. That's true, right? Zero. Oh, if I square zero, I don't get a positive number. Oh, so the square of all integers is positive as long as it is not zero. <laughs> if, if I put the disclaimer in there, now can I say it's always true? Yeah, so if I say, wait, zero, it doesn't work for zero, therefore the statement is false. But not always, it's only false once. So it's better to say when it, the one case when it's false in that, so in that scenario. I'm trying to make an absolute mathematical statement that is not always true. But I can tell you when it is always true. The square of an integer is always even. That's not a true statement. But the square of an even integer is always even, is a true statement. So in that case, I want to use the cases. When I'm doing a disproof, most of the time, by the way, you don't have to break it into cases. I did that today on purpose by using four instead of two as the coefficient of an odd number. If I had used eight, oh gosh, now what would you have to consider? Remainders of one, three, five, one more. Seven. <laughs> you, you also you would have had to consider four cases, and that that would have been mind numbing. No, I, that's not a question you'll ever do. That's it's too much. Okay. Now, any questions? Anything about the last the last quizzes you turned in? Because I I'm not getting any questions. I think I got one question since last time we met. It is okay to ask questions over the weekend, by the way. Um, simple rule of thumb: it's if I haven't got back to you in a reasonable amount of time, just resend the question. Uh, on the weekends, it's not bad. I don't get flooded. During the week, I get flooded. My inbox is completely flooded, especially in the morning. So when someone says, what's the best time of day to send a question? Well, I'm not on my computer all afternoon. I do check my computer periodically in the afternoon, but I don't get a lot of emails in the afternoon. So if you email me in the afternoon, I'm probably going to see it. What I mean is if, if anybody's ever seen my inbox, like during a semester, during a normal semester, I get into my office, let's say, after my first class, maybe it's 10.30 in the morning, I've already received 100 emails. 
easily 100 emails in 7 a.m. Easily. That's every single workday. And so when you email me, you're on page two or page three now. So I don't see it for a little while. And the worst part of that is, is when I get requests for things like, you know, I'll get requests for letters of recommendation and the person doesn't follow up. And when I'm going through and I have time on the weekend and that's delete, delete, delete. Oh, here's a good, you know, delete, delete, answer, delete. I've gone through a hundred deletes and now I come up with a really important request that was sent, you know, three weeks ago. But I haven't seen it because hundreds of emails jumped ahead of them in line and you have to go top down. You can't go bottom up. So email me questions at any time. Rather than try to get out your phone and text me the question, that's kind of what some of your emails seem like, take a picture of it. You know, if, if, if you're not sure, just take a picture of the whole question or take a picture of your whole work. The most common question I get asked is, am I on the right track? And that's probably the best question. Rather than spend a lot of time going around in circles or going in the wrong direction, just say, hey, I'm writing this proof, am I on the right track to start with? And I'll say, yeah, or oh, don't forget, you, you don't have the assumption maybe, or something like that. But those are good questions. If you come to my office, you're asking me the same question. But you might not have that question until later on today. So just email it to me. I will get back to you. I do turn off my computer at a certain point in the evening. And I don't like looking at the lights, the whole blue light thing. I, I don't sleep well. And My son bought me computer glasses for Christmas. I already have computer glasses. It's awful. I have a set of prescription glasses for 30 inches away, you know, big magnifiers. But my son bought me a, um, a special set at Christmas for the blue light thing. And, and they're great. Um, but I still... I don't like looking at my computer after a certain point in the evening, so don't email me at 11. I'm not getting back to you until the next day. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Did you guys like the uh, Luke, I'm your father? That was funny. Did, now, the key to any sort of statement like that, it's always your first thing. Start with the conditional, don't go back to the original statement. All of your answers, if you're wise, you answered from the conditional. Because once you wrote it in the form, if P then Q, aren't all responses now automatic? If not P then not Q, if not Q then not P, if Q then P, P and not Q. Right? Those are all your responses now. And all you've got to do is just say it in an English sentence that kind of makes sense. Hopefully it makes sense. You're not coming up with new words. I love that type of question. Okay, can you unclick that?